Okay, so thank you so much for your attention so far. So I'm just going to wrap up now with some other things to give you a taster that we didn't speak about. So I think you can begin to see that the same approaches of using multiple observations coupled with machine learning can be really useful for a very large variety of problems. And actually the machine learning is a very helpful part that we found augments the whole scientific process. So typically scientific study starts with observations and then we use those observations to help us construct theories. And then based on those theories, we can make simulations and we can check how good that theory is by comparing it to observations. But what about those times when we don't yet have a perfect understanding? But we do have a great deal of data. And we would like to use that data both to help get further scientific insight or make key decisions. So we've seen in very many of the problems we've seen um, up to this point in the mini symposium, it involves decisions of various kinds. So that's where machine learning is really helpful. Ideally, we would like to dispense with machine learning. If we had a perfect theoretical understanding of everything, we wouldn't need this. But we don't yet have that luxury, so while we're moving towards that situation, machine learning basically can learn from the data that we do have. And it lets us both have a predictive capability based on that data and also to do classification. So in the very process of doing this, it can highlight variables that are key for a given problem. So that helps us to further our scientific insight. So the whole purpose of MINT, this consortium of us that are working together, if you want to check out, this is actually our website, um, is to bring together multiple data sources on multiple parameters, on multiple scales, to intelligently and interactively help better understand a given situation, whether that's agriculture, whether it's the ocean, um, and you'll see there's a whole range of health uh, issues too. So it's uh, a consortium of six of us that are working together and these are uh, some of the individuals. In fact, one of the guys just yesterday was on um, the public radio um, about a robotics initiative for high school uh, students. So one of these other examples is, I don't know if you're aware, but at UTD there's an emergency response uh, institute. And what they have is uh, a hazard database that is used routinely by people like the EPA and first responders when there's some um, major spill or disaster or fire in a particular uh, plant, chemical plant for example. And this hazard database basically tells us the location and type of all the key um, chemicals that are stored at a given location. Now, supposing we augment that with our detailed topography of the region where this release could happen to. So in this animation you see here, this is a simulated bioterrorism um, attack on New York. So this terrain is actually the real terrain of New York City at one meter resolution. Mm -hmm. And to acquire that terrain cost about $50,000 to fly a plane over New York City with a laser scanner. But now we have these platforms ourselves that we can mount it on. And instead of having things at a meter accuracy, we can also get down to centimeter accuracy. So that type of information is very useful for things like this or public health on a neighborhood scale. But it's also very useful for uh, geochemical prospecting. Um, in fact, uh, one of the members of our consortium, he just equipped Aramco, which is the Saudi Arabian oil company, with a 3D visualization studio. So they go in the field, they acquire these um, detailed topographies, which are really useful for geoprospecting. And then in addition, there's a, a visualization studio. So when they come back in the lab, they can put on their 3D glasses and interact with this 3D data set. But now with these platforms, we have the capability to go many steps beyond that. We can also have uh, the hyperspectral signature. They're just taking a visible uh, camp picture like you see of Mount Rushmore then, which was used for a film. Um, but we can now have the spectral signature of multiple wavelengths, in fact, 128 wavelengths between 400 and 1,000 nanometers. Then we have our thermal signal, and also we have a synthetic aperture radar. So 
we can now begin to use that to study in very great detail, not just the, the detailed fluid dynamics around these structures, which is then related to the health outcomes, because if you have pollutants being released either from the traffic or some uh, factory or some other sources, then we're breathing that air. And as you can see in this simulation, the distribution of the chemicals are far from homogeneous. They can be very, they can be these little microclimates that um, their extent can be changing in response to the wind speed and direction. So if you couple <coughs> that with the hazard database, we actually can have the next level up for first responders. And the, typically, the critical period is the first hour after such an emergency. So if we have the detailed information that can help those first responders, and in addition, have the robots that can go and do aerial surveys, or the ground-based ones that can drive into those um, potentially very contaminated areas, they can get really useful information to help um, those emergency responders. And so this little panel shows here the optimum evacuation plans based on um, the current situation. And this is, you can have a real-time response from uh, a Mac or PC program or embedded in handheld devices. But in addition, we can then use this whole infrastructure to guide us in making more um, observations, which will help us further characterize what's going on further identify, say, the, the sources of the release, for example. But then in addition, once we've gathered all this data, it becomes much more useful if we can interact with it. Because sometimes you can be flooded with an overwhelming volume of data, and how on earth are we going to make sense of it? So to turn the information into insight. So a really useful thing um, to do that is to have a four-dimensional interactive environment. So by four dimension, I mean the three spatial dimensions and then time. And so an example of that is shown on the top right here. So what you see is the terrain, which was captured by a laser scanner. And then overlaid on that, you see a photograph. So you see the photorealistic terrain. But then you see the line along there, which is a pipeline. And along this pipeline, there are a set of different wells. And when you click on each of these wells, you can get the detailed well logs for that location. But this flexible uh, platform and parameter acquisition system, which is essentially what we have, could just as well be used for agriculture, or um, so I mean crop analysis, or for example for animals. So you can imagine uh, we're working with Cargill up in Amarillo. They have, uh, this is a throwaway fact, uh, 8 million cows are currently present within 150 miles of Amarillo, which represents 30% of the U.S. herd. So those, those cows are typically on feeding lots of about 50,000 cows per feeding lot, and it's run by 10 people. So if a cow has a fever, there's no way they would really know about it till the cow <laughs> might die even before they realize it. But if we fly over with one of these robotic vehicles with our thermal camera, we will actually have several hundred pixels per animal with the detailed temperature information. And we can use the laser scanner to measure the, how their size changes, which is related to their weight, and of course how long they'll stay on the feeding lot. So you could then imagine that the decision makers for the feeding lot, instead of clicking on the wells, they could be clicking on animals. They would get their temperature history, they could have automated alerts when an animal has a fever, and each cow is RFID tagged on its ear, so as we fly over, we can read those RFIDs and we know which animal we're looking at. So you can begin to see that this type of flexible acquisition system can be really useful for a very large uh, number of problems. Another area which we didn't really touch on today is in the area of health, human health, um, of the products of things like fires and actually the fires themselves. So we have three projects funded by the DOD, the Institute of Integrative Health and the NIH to use satellite observations to uh, estimate on a global daily basis the particulates coming from a whole range of sources like fires and um, dust, windblown dust. Now, you might think, well, so what? What's the big deal about that? Well, there are several big deals about that. First of all, there are approximately 22 million people in the US at the moment that have asthma. 
One of the triggers for asthma um, are particulates. In addition, U.S. servicemen serving overseas are coming back in increasing numbers with severe respiratory issues, and that is in large part due to particulates that they have inhaled while uh, service. So if we have a daily global map estimating the amount of particulates, and we know the rosters of each of those service personnel, we can then fly them back in time for wherever they were and get accumulated estimated, uh, estimated dosage. And so why would we use remote sensing as well as such instruments? Well, from the helicopters and planes, we get the detailed in situ information. But from the satellites, we can also get a very big picture, for, like the burnt area, the products coming off, like the CO and CO2, and they transport way downwind from the sources. So we're probably all familiar with constellations of stars, but you might not know that we also have constellations of satellites. So if we take observations of different kinds from multiple satellites, we can actually piece together a much more complete picture. And a good example of that is uh, probably one of the most widely used remote sensing platforms over the last decade have been the two MODIS instruments flying on NASA, Aqua, and Terra. Now these platforms give us global daily coverage across a very wide swath of a whole suite of products. And one of them that are relevant to atmospheric particulates is something called the total aerosol optical depth, which is a measure of the light extinction um, in a vertical profile of the atmosphere from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. Now, several health studies have used that as a proxy for how many of these particulates we're breathing. And the issue there is some of these particulates are so small that they can get past the hair in our lungs, um, in our nose, and get down into our lungs. So it's really useful to know how many we have. But this total extinction that MODIS is seeing is coming from a a vertical profile which is many kilometers high. Some of that is close to the surface where we are, but a lot of it is way above us, as you can see from this visualization here. So in 2006, another satellite was uh, launched called Calypso. It was a joint venture between the French agency CNES and NASA. And that, for the first time, had a laser beam, which is basically it's a light radar profiling the atmosphere. So this visualization of this colored curtain here, where it's red, we have high backscatter from these particulates, and where it's blue, we have low. So the backscatter is directly related to how many of the particles they are. So where it's red, we have a lot of them, and where it's blue, you have a clean atmosphere. So this is really great. For the first time, we can see at very high resolution, 100 meter vertical resolution, exactly where the particles are. The downside is, Although this satellite traverses the, the whole Earth every day in 14 and 3 quarter orbits, we have big gaps between these vertical curtains. They basically measure just underneath the satellite. So we have gaps of about 2,000 kilometers between successive curtains. So what we do is we take a Newton's law of motion and the current, um, Newton's laws of motion and the current wind speeds and directions that we get for the meteorological analyses and then we basically fly forward and backward trajectories from each of these curtains. So this is actually a massive number crunching. It's like drinking from a fire hose. It's terabytes of data that turns into even more terabytes of data by the time we finish. But then we use that to estimate the fraction of this total optical depth mode of seas that's closest to the surface where we're breathing. So then we can relate that directly to the concentration of the particulates. But then also from our um, helicopters and our plane, in fact, the reason why this plane is largely being built is we already have a particle spectrometer that will be mounted directly in here, so it gets the full size distribution from nanometer scale to uh, many microns. Um, and so then not only are we measuring it remotely, we're measuring it in situ as a quality control of our product and or if we're interested in neighborhood scale public health, we can deploy these, you can imagine, over neighborhoods and get an unprecedented level of detail. So the colleagues I'm working with in that area, when they heard about this, they got really excited because it's never been done before to have public health type observations made on such a, a small scale, comprehensively over uh, entire neighborhoods. Now, these um, 
air parcel trajectories that we're talking about. So in this case, we see a uh, modus picture of the fires in Orange County. And I guess in Texas, we had our share of fires this year. But what's notable about these is it's really important to use the observations in their physical context. Because typically, we have air blowing from the ocean um, in Southern California here onto the land. But in this case, we see the reverse situation with um, the air going from the land to the ocean. So when we consider our air parcel trajectories, we need to make sure that we're considering the appropriate winds um, for the time. So we take the remote sensing observations and we use them in their physical context. And zooming out and zooming in, um, at the same time, you can see that these plumes go way out to sea, in this case, or you can zoom into individual fires. Now, another example of this is um, dust particles going from the Sahara to um, uh, Florida in a few days. So these red lines are using Newton's laws of motion to have the air parcel trajectories, and you can see they join together similar features in these LIDAR profiles. So we're doing this on a routine daily basis, um, and it's, it's a massive number crunching exercise. But then in addition, each of these instruments we're trying to merge into a, into a consistent data set have their own data bias issues. So that's where again machine learning comes to the rescue in cross calibrating each instrument against ground truth. So to cut a long story short, what we end up with is, oops, okay, this is good. So this is the fraction of the total extinction happening in a vertical profile of the atmosphere in the lowest kilometer. And you can see I've done it on a global basis, and you can see the day at the top. So where it's red, the boundary layer where we're breathing has a, a whole lot of aerosols in it, so these particulates, and where it's blue, the boundary layer is clean. So, and everything in between. So you see how these features um, move with the large-scale weather systems. Now, why would we be interested in that? Well, we've seen some of that, but really the goal is this is just the beginning of a global um, environmental information system. So we can couple that global environmental data to global environmental health data. And why would we be interested in that? Well, just to take an example, I was very grateful to be able to get anonymized form of all the hospital admissions um, for 2002 for the state of Maryland. And it turns out that most of those emissions were for the city of Baltimore. So I just studied the city of Baltimore and used the available roadside data that the EPA provide on particulates, CO, temperature, a whole range of different pollutants, and correlated them to every single um, admission category. And I don't know if you're aware, but if you go to a hospital, um, your, what you go in with, whether it's a broken arm, uh, a graze, or um, an asthma, incident, whatever it is, schizophrenia, everything is given um, an ICD code. At the time this was done, it's ICD-9, and at the moment, it's ICD-10. It's a classification system. So I then compared every single ICD-9 code in a global exploratory <coughs> data mining exercise to all the different environmental parameters I had available. And so these two plots are plotting the number of hospital admissions in a month with a type of asthma to um, a given environmental parameter. Now, if you search for literature, you find that for this type of asthma, the literature talks about um, ozone being important and particulates being important. But then when you actually take the data, it turns out that the highest correlation is between two things that are not even mentioned in the literature. They're CO and temperature. So this makes the point really well. We need to have the comprehensive data that we can link with the comprehensive the environmental health data to link to the comprehensive um, environmental data to see the relationships. What are the triggers for different conditions? But then we want to take it to the next level. And imagine we were to have asthma. We've identified what our triggers are as uh, an example that would be relevant to 22 million people in this country. Um, it would be really great to get real-time text message alerts or other alerts of that kind to say, this is a heads up, today you can expect this weather event or this air quality event that could lead to an emergency room visit for you, so make sure you have your inhaler or avoid strenuous activity or whatever it is. Using in the remote sensing to a very practical societal benefit. Um, 
So we, this movie is, um, has scary music as well. We saw it moving earlier on at one of these bioterrorism events. But coupled to this, our key idea is having these intelligent um, observations. So that last video didn't quite work well. Basically what it was, we had a virtual observing system there which we were using to target in real time what observations we make. Now, time is running out, so I think I'm going to skip through um, some of these. Now, um, some of the other things we looked at is we saw earlier on in Brian's talk about the shale basins that he was mentioning for the extraction of natural gas. And I don't know if you have a full grasp of the scale of this, but there are 20 shale basins in partly going into 50 states across the country. So this is a real big deal, and there's going to be extraction of methane um, from all of these. So once the methane has been extracted, then they are transferred by pipelines. And this is the pipeline network across the country. And us in Dallas-Fort Worth region, we're like at the hub of this network. So each of these pipelines is um, transferring natural gas. Think of how many pipeline miles there are here to monitor. If we can have a system that can effectively detect leaks, um, we just have a tremendous safety thing right there, in addition to the whole greenhouse gas issue, which is important in its own right. So the idea then is to have this aerial sniffer dog for methane type of thing, which hopefully tomorrow will be our first flight flying the methane sensors. Um, on the helicopter. Then there's the agricultural stuff we mentioned, and then we are really excited that with Texas A&M Extension, which is just across the, I told you about this one already, just across the fence behind us, um, we're going to be able to monitor um, with this hyperspectral signatures, the synthetic aperture radar and the thermal signatures, um, to look at the crop health when we have signs of infestation and so on. And the idea that will then plug into the whole infrastructure that people like John Deere have made. So I don't know if you're aware of the really fancy technology that goes on with this, but this combine harvester is automatically controlling this tractor trailer and all the others operating in the field. And they're getting to the stage where they can all work automatically. None of them need drivers. Like so fleets of these tractors can be plowing a field to sub-centimeter accuracy totally autonomously, um, and harvesting and planting, and it's really amazing. So they're building this open infrastructure called Farm Site, which is being launched this year. And in the market research that John Deere did, when they asked their customers what do they want, the number one thing they wanted was crop analysis. So the farmer could know when there were water issues, when there were infestation issues. Um, you can even, from the hyperspectral signatures, get information on the, the carbon and nitrogen content of the soil. So, you imagine if you have one of these little guys who can routinely fly over a farm, and he can, by the coupling the observations with the machine learning, we can get information on the water content of the soil, the water content of the plant, if they're under water stress, when an infestation is happening. So, preventative action can be taken quickly using less chemicals before it has a severe impact on the crop. So this is a really very practical way of how um, this robotics, um, autonomy, and remote sensing can be used for society. And the final one is we're also using this machine learning to help um, wounded warriors. So the predominant wounds of soldiers coming back at the moment, which is becoming a a really uh, critical problem is traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's basically, the warriors are used to having gun battles, but bombs blowing up near them, it does really bad things to people. So their body armor protects them from bullets, but when you have these explosions, not only can they lose limbs, the, the trauma to the brain actually can have very long-term effects. So, approximately 15% of all the troops coming back from a single deployment will have traumatic brain injury. Many of these troops have been on multiple deployments. So it's getting to the level where it's really critical. And as a result of this, suicides 
in troops between 2009 and 2011 has resulted in 20% of all the war deaths. So it's actually uh, an emergency proportion. So the army and the, the military as a whole has really been open to new holistic ways of treating the medicine. Now our part of this is we're using the same machine learning technology that Nabin was talking about for the classification to try and classify these conditions. Then also to rate their effectiveness and have some predictive tool that given this signature in a given patient, they will typically respond to a given treatment in this way. So the optimum care plan for them, given where they are and the facilities available, would be this. And um, part of that is very straightforward things just in the design of the hospitals. So they're finding if you, for example, if you have this ward that was called plain tree ward, um, where there's a decrease of staff walking patterns, um, it was much more efficient for the nursing staff, but the decreased noise resulted in a decreased readmission rate. And just having uh, beautiful rooms and single occupancy room, by beautiful I mean having like nature murals on the wall, it actually speeded up the patient's recovery. So it's really remarkable. So it's from the simple things like that to also um, identifying the patterns with the machine learning. So what they built at Walter Reed Medical Center um, is this new uh, center called the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, which was built all by a, a donation of a philanthropist. And this is part of a vision for the hospital of the future. So part of that is in the very layout. Instead of having multiple disciplines, so you go for, do you see this physician to have this set of tests, then another one, and you're going through all these white clinical rooms, which is kind of scary just to be there. You go through a nice environment, but they're all next to each other. So all the physicians are working together in teamwork. So there's good communication, and um, they also in this place with their families. So, uh, and it also, the, the places where they are seen for their consultations are going to be near this stream underneath the trees. So instead of going into a white clinical building which just a stress level goes up just to be there, you hear the tranquil water and you're talking with your physician in a really nice environment. So already there's been dramatic um, improvements as a result of this. So, Again, you can see that um, this machine learning and uh, just identifying signatures of things can be really useful in such a wide variety of uh, cases. So thanks for your attention, and I hope today was enjoyable for you.